Hi, everyone. Welcome to FlightAware's Central to Aviation Conversations. Today, I have the distinct honor and pleasure of speaking with Eamon Brennan, Director General of Eurocontrol, about sustainability, efficiency, and a longer-term view as well to survival versus thriving in a post-COVID era that we hope to, to be in soon. So, Eamon, thanks so much for taking time to do this and offer us some sulella. That's great, uh, Daniel. Listen, I'm delighted to be here and um, good morning to everybody on, on your side of the pond. I hope everything's working out. So um, hopefully we'll have a good chat, Daniel. Yeah, absolutely. You know, your your background there reminds me that I've missed the annual Eurocontrol user forum that I think is, is January of every year uh, in your, your office in, in Brussels. I, I imagine that uh, uh, I'm not the only one there. How, how are things going at Eurocontrol? Yeah, so everything is okay. I mean, we're the same as everybody else, but like just per introduction for Eurocontrol, you, you probably know we've got 41 member states. So we, we manage the network for basically all of Europe and we do the sustainability, the environment, but also we collect all the fees for all the air traffic controller organizations. So you can imagine with traffic been 70% down in the last year, everybody's getting a little bit excited about financial matters and you know these are problems we're facing at the moment we're in the middle of a wave so it's difficult yeah no i, I understand you touched on sustainability which is one of the things i think would be interesting for us to talk about that's you know, a major initiative for Eurocontrol. Many of us know that you recently appointed Marilyn Baston as a head of sustainability. I believe it's a new role and a testament to how important this is to you and Eurocontrol. And of course, it's reflective of the thinking throughout Europe. So, but can you tell us a little bit, what is the focus of this? Is this around um, distribution and availability of things like sustainable alternative fuel, SAF? Is it about enabling airports uh, for an airspace for hydrogen or electric aircraft? Is it efficiency focus? What, what are you working on there? And what's Maryland really uh, taking charge of? Okay, so um, that's a really good question, Daniel. And, and I, it's kind of a very wide question. So I think it'd be better if I just looked at a start, at the kind of start. First yeah. of all, as you're, you're aware, they, they, there's a global initial called Corsia, which has been run by ICAO, which is effectively a, a carbon trading scheme. And uh, in Europe, we have a thing called the emissions trading scheme, which is kind of a, a European slightly more severe version of that, but effectively it's carbon trading, it's offsetting. So what we're working on in Eurocontrol is basically on two fronts. One, we're looking at trying to make the air traffic management network more efficient. And here we're looking at things like, you know, um, efficient routes, uh, vertical flight profiles, trajectories. You know, a lot of the stuff actually some of your products actually offer to, to, to people, but basically we're looking at, you know, how we can make Europe better because, you know, you know, people have been flying the same routes for, you know, maybe 40, 50 years. The same happens in the United States, actually, yeah, yeah. you know, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is we're looking at what can we do to improve? And we're working very closely with Airbus and with the commission to improve aircraft design in terms of, you know, what I would call blended wing, but also hydrogen, electrification, and of course, SAF. And there's a huge push on at the moment to promote um, SAF in Europe. But like it's, it's a big debate because people see SAF as a long haul solution and maybe electrification and hybrids as a short term. So that's what we're working on, the whole remit. And then, of course, we report on everything to everybody. And a green deal in Europe is really important at the moment. You know, um, Europe is an amazing place, Daniel, because they've concluded that the most efficient form of carbon neutral transportation for everybody is a bicycle. Yeah, I know I can I can believe that. You touched on routes, which is interesting. We worked on a project and continue to with an airline that's really recognizing that just because it was the way they did it before doesn't necessarily make sense. And I think one of the ironies is you can invest in a very sophisticated flight planning engine, for example, and find the most optimal route from a fueling perspective. But it might surprise you that if you if you make a list of the 10 most efficient routes, and of course you file the first one, you might find out that due to air traffic control restrictions or due to uh, other factors, you end up, if you file number one, flying number seven 
right? And so we've worked with carriers to be able to identify, uh, you know, what they filed versus what they flew, how frequently that deviation is. And they might ultimately realize if you file the second most efficient route, you'll actually get to fly that, which is far more efficient than trying to over optimize. And so the, the problem is a little more complex than people think because of all the, you know, we're flying in the real world, right? We're not flying in a flight planning engine. And I think that's even more the case in Europe where the airspace is so much more complicated than the US with all of your, your member states. So, you know, do you work on that much as it relates to the cross border policies for handoffs and those sorts of things to help operators optimize even further? Yeah, I mean, that's what that's actually one of our key functions, Daniel. I mean, just, just to, to help, if you fly anywhere in Europe, you need a green light for what we call the network manager here so that your route is, is, is you know, secure from A to B. So if you want to fly from, say, London to Athens, you know, we'll take your, all the steps through and we'll, we'll work out the routes. And, of course, we know the fuel and all that. But what you say is very true because every operator files for the best plan. I mean, that's normal. So if right. you're an operator, you'll file for what you think is the optimum route in terms of, of um, you know, great circle, in terms of fuel, in terms of horizontal efficiency. But when it comes to us, we probably are not in a position to offer you that because, you know, everybody wants this at the same time. So, you know, everybody wants to leave London at 6.40 London time in the morning. That can't that's happen. Right. And then you've got the complication of North Atlantic arrivals coming in. So what we do basically is we, we repose a thing which is commonly known as a restriction, but the pilots call it slots. And consequently, we get our bad name in Europe because when you hear from Europe control early in the morning, it's generally not good news because right. we're trying to protect the system. So it is true what you say that I think sometimes if you, they, some of the airlines had a product and if they looked at, you know, maybe been a bit smart and gaming the system a bit better and looking for route number four and number five, they might actually get that. But they all take the view of Cascade, go the whole way down, and they leave it up to us. And we do come under pressure in the morning at, say, about six to eight, just to move team. So we will just move people everywhere, you know. And the other thing I just want to mention here is we also level cap a lot, Daniel, which is a very, you know, not good for the environment. So we, we, we're often operating, say, 8320s around the center of Europe at, say, flight level 180, 18,000 feet. And that, of course, is a lot of fuel burn. So I think you can invest in making sure that you fly more efficiently by looking actually at the patterns and using big data to actually look at this. Because if you just randomize everything and always look for the best, your record should teach you that that actually is not possible. No, that's right. And I think you touched on, you know, you can get bad news that you're going to be delayed in the morning and the reference to slots. People do, I, I agree completely, people need to recognize that in the US, we call that ground delay programs. Um, no one wants a delay, right? Whether you're the regulator, the operator, the passenger, but we can all agree it's far more efficient to be sitting at the gate right, on ground power, no engines running, then holding over an airport, right, uh, burning burning fuel, putting wear and tear on, on airplanes, uh, you know, putting stress on the crew. And so the, the reality is there's a limited amount of runway and space. And so uh, I think optimizing that is a key thing. And, you know, we've actually um, worked on that a bit ourselves. Our information tools are, are a building block for some of this. You probably know a bit about our predictive technology foresight. Mm -hmm. It's having an impact in Europe. Uh, one of our launch customers uh, was actually Fraport. And so their airport operations in Frankfurt which you know, they have a large sustainability initiative, as you know, uh, leverages our data to do uh, stand and gate allocation uh, and predictions around uh, aircraft movements, which aligns exactly with the, the thinking that, that you're talking about now. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I mean, the, the stuff you're doing with Fraport is actually very innovative, um, Daniel, in, the, in terms of managing the arrivals and looking at what the real-time situation is. I mean, the, the reality is that airports can actually help themselves a lot um, you know, let's just go back to the basics. I mean, in the last 10 years, we've reduced holding in your air holding by 80%. So That's fantastic. One of our basic foundations is we'll keep you at the gate. We won't let you move back unless we can get you in. And we're, we're trying to do things like continuous descent uh, arrivals, even in small sectors in Europe, to save um, CO2, but also the passenger experience. I mean, you know, it might be uncomfortable to be left at your gate, but it's a lot more uncomfortably to be circling around that flight Absolutely. level 200 over an airport, maybe in a, in, a, in you know, convective weather or something like this. So, so the more prediction and the more information the airline has, um, but also the airport, and I think the stuff you're doing with Fraport, integrating the data there is actually very useful to, to make sure that the actual airport operator 
for you know particularly for stand um allocation and for use of taxiways and this is really good so we we think that stuff's pretty good yeah we're excited about it and you touched on on weather i'm not sure if you've heard about this we're we're really excited so of course we have a global network of uh ground-based MODAS and ADSB receivers. And so we have a, we've been using that for flight tracking for years. We're using that to support yep. surface movement and predictive, but we have a new partnership uh, with a company called Synoptic. And what we're doing with them is we're aggregating all of the weather data that we can receive and derive from aircraft. So air aircraft as they emit MODAS are emitting more than just positional data. So we can figure out things like uh, winds and temperature and pressure. And as a result, we're able to aggregate all of that provide that to them and they're using it to do better forecasting. And the bottom line is once you have really sound, truthful data, this can be used by companies in a, a myriad of applications. It can improve lives, not only for flight planning, not only for ground operations, but more broadly, you know, across both aviation and outside of aviation for forecasting. And so it seems like we're really able to exploit this to have a, a really, really big impact, which is exciting. Yeah, that's good, Daniel. I mean, weather, you know, I, I was a former pilot myself, weather is really important. You know, I mean, we, we, we all know this. And if you look at, for instance, we're getting real-time weather information, I think particularly if you're using satellite-based uh, weather systems and, and, you know, the mode S stuff is pretty standard at this stage, but it really is good if you can put it in together in a package. I mean, you know, what my experience with weather is is is, is that in the Europe, you know, it comes on us pretty quick. I mean, you know, we, we have situations where weather would develop in the core area of Europe, and then you've got a problem straight away because your, your options for diversions are actually quite limited because we don't have a lot of airspace. In the right. United States, you, you're actually better at weather than we are in Europe because you've got more space. Here, yeah. you know, if I've got a storm over Paris, then i got to either move aircraft out to the Atlantic or got to move them over Switzerland and you know both of those are pretty tricky options because yeah. they're both high density routes so you know predictive weather data is very useful particularly if a guy decides to himself to kind of move away from it before he realizes that he's in trouble because real-time action is much more difficult for air traffic control yeah no that's absolutely right and I agree with your point about uh just the the complexity of of Europe and, and density as it talks to, and it's as we we're talking about efficiency and, and kind of scarcity of airspace, you do touch on one really big issue that is key to sustainability is efficiency. And efficiency has really been the core technical focus of, of FlightAware. I think an, an irony we've seen over the last year is that despite a reduction in demand for travel and, and you know more airspace availability and more airplane avail availability, we've actually seen a greater demand for this sort of efficient technology during COVID I think because there is uh, a scarcity of resources, there's more concern about the economics of operating aircraft, um, and we've been able to make a big difference. So there's a, there's a number of, of players in ATFM, right? Um, there's some really, there's a small number of big players, Eurocontrol being one of them. Um, when we talk about the small regional players, there's companies like Metron, right? They focus on regional ATFM markets, and this is... Uh, you know, regional sort of to the same point you're making about complexities in Europe around weather, it requires a lot of cooperation, right? Cross-border cooperation. So we actually announced a partnership with Metron a few months ago, and they're using our global data set for use in these regional and cross-border ATFM applications. You know, what do you see the impact of that sort of initiative? You know, these sorts of applications being for regional and in integrating with some of the larger ATFM operators like Eurocontrol? Okay, so Daniel, so I, I mean, I, I know Metron very well. When I was in the Irish Aviation Authority, I worked closely there with Monty Belger and all these guys from the FAA that used to be there in, in, in Metron. So their, their products are pretty good. I mean, what, what I would say generally about AT, ATFM is the fact that, you know, we've started to move to satellite based. And here in Eurocontrol, we've integrated, for instance, and I know you have the same product, we've integrated Arium flight yep. data. I, I formerly was a director of Arium. We've integrated that into our, our, our um, ATFM system. So we now have kind of got global reach. Yeah, just we, we look at an aircraft shortly after it leaves Singapore. We look at when it hits European airspace, you know, when a descent is likely, and we advise all the centers along the way to make sure that handle this flight in this way. So what we're trying to do is maximize airspace capacity by using these predictive tools for planning better. Because, I mean, if I could give you an example, um, uh, Daniel, like we, we've seen examples where, for instance, you know, aircraft leave, say, Gatwick, and they're flying to Milan, and we, we want them to go a certain way. 
And sure. then actually what happens is when they take off, the pilot contacts the control center and he gets his buddy, the controller, to send him a, send him a different way because it's actually a little bit faster. But the reality is by him doing that, okay, he actually has stopped and caused slot delays for others along the way. Right. So yeah, okay. in Europe, you know, this is why we've got to, you know, enforce what I would call standard ATFM in Europe so that we maximize the overall system. So my, my, my reaction to, you know, we work very closely with the FAA's command center. They're just outside Washington and with Terry Bristol's team. But there is scope, definitely what I would call for product in Southeast Asia and smaller areas, you know, because some of them are developing things called time-based separation and other kind of tools like this. But what I would say is that there's always a good system to plug into the big system because in reality, um, Daniel, you're probably not going to change the um, relationship with the FAA that we have because, you know, we, we have real time with the FAA. They have real time with us. So, you know, we, we stop aircraft coming across the Atlantic if we can't handle them in Europe. We've got weather and they can do the same with us. So it's important that, you know, two big players do like this. But in the world, they're the two biggest. But there actually really isn't anybody else doing the same kind of um, product. So I think there's great opportunity there. And it would be very beneficial, particularly, I think, in areas like South America, also in North Asia as well. You know, I think there's good, there's good scope there. But really, it's got to be on an integrated. What Your product has got to be able to plug into our product here. You know, but, you know it doesn't really yeah. do the operator much good if you can't do that. And also with the FAA. So I, I think there's great opportunity, definitely, to do that. You know, I think one of the coolest things that I, I see in aviation addressing this problem is collaborative decision making, right? CDM, which basically acknowledges that there's a lot of stakeholders here, right? You have the, the ANSP, you have the airports, you have the operators and, and, and many other stakeholders. And so CDM, um, which has a ton of different implementations across, you know, different stakeholders and, and different states and, and countries really enables people to um, prioritize what's best for them. And then everyone kind of is, is collaboratively trying to prioritize what ultimately is best for everybody. When you talk about the US and Europe, as it relates to um, basically taking taking delays or enforcing um, limitations on on capacity, you know, how do you see these systems coming together in in five or 10 years, right, so that there can really be um, what I would call souped and out CDM, right? So that an operator uh, in Europe going to the US, for example, uh, can have have a say in that, particularly the larger operators that have a lot of flights and are really a big factor in this capacity. So that it's more than a blunt instrument and it, it ends up you know, making it be a better travel experience so that operators can focus on, for example, perhaps prioritizing the delayed flight, for example, and ultimately mm -hmm. getting people where they wanna go. Yeah. I mean, Daniel, I mean, that's yeah, that's a really important issue. So what we're doing in Europe about it is we do use a blunt instrument at the moment, you know, and the instrument we use is basically restrictions, slots, flight capping, all of these kind of things. So what we're what we're moving to in the future is is collaborative decision making. And we work very closely. I mean, just at the moment, to give you an idea of the complexity, of the problem we've got, we're connected directly live to uh, about 60 air traffic centers in Europe and in Asia. But we're also connected to about 800 towers, okay, airports all, yeah. all over. So first of all, straight away, you've got a big data management problem to keep everybody on the same track. So that's problem number one. Yeah. So answering your solution for the future, what we've decided to do is invest about 300 to 350 million in a whole new system for Europe. It would be really one of the most advanced in the world that's using cloud-based technology. And the way we're going to get the collaborative decision making to work is not going to be, you know, the old fashioned way of phoning a guy and talking them around. Yeah, and yeah. The about. We're actually going to use the cloud so that every air traffic provider and every tower will see the data that we have and will see the basis on which we make the decision. So they'll have an appeal basis. So to give you a good example, we've had, for instance, some of the larger airlines and we like, I'll give you a good example would be a flight from, say, London Heathrow. Uh, you know, with Iberia going to, to Barcelona or going to Madrid. Now, if they're 10 minutes apart, you know, often what happens is Iberia will want the flight to Madrid to, to take priority over the Barcelona one. Why? Because they've got connections, they've gone out to South America. So the revenue loss from a slip up on that one is much higher. So this is what we were going to try and do is implement collaborative decision making much more by 
giving everybody visibility, transparency, and this comes about by using cloud-based technology and interactive dashboards and this kind of thing. And that's what we're going to roll out as part of our INM program. I think that's awesome. I think that having a, a broader cloud and, and um, more consistent approach is helpful because something that I've seen in the past is that there are so many CDM platforms that, for example, US airlines will implement a broad FAA CDM, but then they won't really have the resources to implement, for exam example, uh, um, uh, one of the CDM programs in Paris, right? Even though they may fly there several times per day, they can't operate a hundred different programs, yeah. right? And so you end up saying, okay, only the largest airlines in their home country or airport are actually participating in CDM until it's, and until it's, you know, adopted more broadly, there's there's not really that impact there. And so what's the time frame for this? You know, when do you think you'll you'll be rolling this out and operators will start implementing it? So, so at the moment, Daniel, I mean, the, one of the big advantages we've got in Euro control is we've got a lot of buy-in from the stakeholders. So at the moment, we've got about 50, 60 airports networked to us for CDM, all the big yeah. ones. Okay. So straight away, we see what they're doing. They see what we're doing and we react to that. We're going to expand out that program to everybody. So by about 2025, we'll roll out the first version of INM, and that will be provided free to basically everybody all over Europe. And the idea is that they will have the common platform. Now, the reason we think this will work is because it's such a large scale. You know, it's going to be the only platform you actually should use because it'll have all the actual real-time information and it'll have the NSPs linked together with the towers, together with the uh, airport operators, and also the carriers as well, the larger network carriers. So we're trying to get a good platform to make sure that this works, but we're actually going to be also very open in that we give access to this technology to developers or people who want to do front-end systems. So to make sure that overall, you know, it's not a monopoly situation, but when you look at it at the end of the day, you know, somebody has got to cement the whole thing together. And, and in the US, that's the FAA and yeah. agencies. Yeah, so uh, you know, you touched on Network Manager, and I, I've actually participated in the Network Manager conferences and events and mailing lists for about a decade. And one thing that really, um, when, when people ask me, you know, what's it about, right, and, and what's the impact, I talk about um, the efficiency-minded strategy, and in particular around the accountability. So what I mean is, Eurocontrol not only holds itself and the stakeholders of their ANSPs uh, to increasing standards for delays that impact air aircraft, um, but actually publishes these publicly. And I think that's one of the things you just touched on a moment ago, which is the 80% reduction in, in airborne delays. That's something that Eurocontrol publishes, uh, I believe monthly, right? And has goals to continually improve uh, and ultimately reduce the amount of delays. What do you think the future is of that strategy? Because at some point you're gonna see a little bit of diminishing returns, right? You're already at 80%. Uh, and you know what's next as far as a standard or a metric that you want to be held accountable for, for improving flight operations? Okay, so, so um, for me, Daniel, I think we've got a long way to go. So you, you painted it very nice. I would like to end the interview there because you, you, you showed it much better than it actually is. So <laughs> when I talk about 80%, I'm talking about 80% of holding delays at an airport. We've, a limit, we've, we've got rid of those by the network manager, but what we've yeah. not got rid of is en route delays. So to give you an example, in 2019, you know, and in 2018, during the summer, we we're averaging about 37,000 flights a day. You know, contrast that with the US, which is 45, 46, but in a huge land area. So we've got a concentrated 37,000 and a big mix of traffic. We were running up average, you know, one third of all flights were delayed in 2019. Let's wow. just think about that. And yeah. the average delay was 49 minutes. Okay, so when you're faced with that scenario, you're doing something wrong. And are you talking about ground delays or these are airborne delays? Or airborne what? delays. I'm talking about en route delays. Okay. So we can't give you, we can't let you off the ground because the, the sky's too full. That's Clear. the reality. So it's, yes, so, it's both really. Yeah, so the problem you've got is in the core area of Europe, okay? You've got a couple of bottlenecks that we're trying to sort out. So we're working very closely with our colleagues in Germany and in the south of France in particular to deal with these hotspots. And the reality is, is as well is that, you know, also there's great opportunity, you know, in the years ahead to kind of improve this, but it does need a little bit of, you know, smarter flight planning. And maybe just to outline to you, in 2019, we were diverting large amounts of flights away from, say, um, the Karlsruhe area of, of Germany. We were moving flights away from Barcelona, Marseille, ch changing the routes. And obviously in Europe, when you do this, there's a knock-on effect. And to give you just a simple example, we redesigned the airspace recently for the third runway in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. And 
when we finished that, we realized that it had a knock on effect in Malmo approach. Now you gotta think that through. So it's like moving kind of like things up along the way. So all of this is a problem. So for us, I think that um, we've got about four or five years of a challenge and the INM program, we think will actually sort a lot of this out because we'll be able to produce more routes. We'll actually be able to produce better trajectories and we'll actually try and put the flights where the capacity are on, on one front, or if, and we may even be looking at offering different flight levels at different prices. This is what the European oh, wow. Commission's um, uh, uh, program is, you know, the variability of prices. So there's a lot of options there, but we're about three or four years away. So just to finish on this speech, the key thing at the moment is everybody's taking a pause. And actually what's happened at the moment is in 2020 and at the moment we have collective amnesia has struck Europe because of COVID, okay? But I guarantee you that once you go back to 2023 and the summer heats up again, you will find very quickly, we'll be back to these delays and the hot spots and then knock-ons again. And that's where we got to roll out this INN. No, that's right. I think that that touches on an interesting point, which is that the likes of flight aware and Euro control are in a weird position right now because uh, demand for flights is is at a you know is a low for many many years yet we're still working on creating the efficiency because we know it's going to come back right and because we know we have to address these problems you know, worldwide flight traffic went down uh, 80% in April 2020 um, we saw some recovery uh, in the middle and, and kind of second half of last year that went downward again um, in the US we've seen a huge recovery in the last I'd say month uh, in Europe, uh, not so much. We haven't seen that that type of recovery yet. Um, and as we think about the the pandemic and the impact that, that it has, and uh, you know, you publish a lot of numbers, both around efficiency as well as as funding numbers. Uh, as you know, route charges that you have in Europe, it's not a not a factor in the U.S. Um, funding comes more from ticket sales. So, what are your thoughts about how ANSPs will be funded in the future, and is that going to change as a result of what we've seen in the last year? And, and how do you see Eurocontrol getting back to a thriving organization uh, post COVID? Okay, so so normally in um, in a normal year, Daniel, we collect about ten billion in route charges. You know, if you think about that, last year we connect we collected about three point five. So we're about seventy percent down. So in, in, in funding. And of course, obviously, this is putting a lot of a squeeze, but it's putting a squeeze on things like capital programs, investment, you know, and it's slowing everything down because it, it's important. I've always said to all the NSPs, keep investing in CapEx. You know, yeah. now when traffic is low, you don't gain anything by stopping CapEx. That's actually. right. Now you, can, you can invest. And I think some of the points you're making there, you know, why are people buying stuff off you and why are we doing stuff at the moment? Because actually, it's a good time to assess your efficiency and yep. maybe replace labor with technology and, you know, change some things like this. So my, my idea is very simple. Like, I believe that the, the European system of route charges is actually fundamentally more stable than the American system. I mean, I remember talking to Russ Chu, who was the head of the, uh, I think she was Terry's uh, predecessor in the FAA ops, you know, and I remember okay. they, they had a ticket tax on the, on the, to pay for ATC. It was added onto the price of ticket. And the assumption when that was added on was that ticket prices would always keep rising because they did up to then. Suddenly you look in the United States, Southwest come in, you know, jet blue were right and fares tumble by 40, 45%. Then you find you've got a problem. So I think the European system of having a known funding mechanism, it's not built for this kind of a dip that we've got at sure. the moment. We just, we just got to struggle through. I think it provides more financial stability for the platform. I'm not a big fan of the American system of where Terry and the team and the FAA have to go every week, year up to the hill like beggars and, you know, see what they can get and, you know, argue with the senators. And, you know, one guy said he'd like a radar here and a guy likes ADSB and another guy likes, um, you know, MODES. And you, you're, 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 I feel it takes from long term planning from the FAA. So I, 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 really always favor and have always favored the United States going through a root charge system. And I've been over there on many occasions, discussed this on panels, but you know, business aviation don't want it. But I, I think you get a better service from the FAA because it's a great organization if you've got stable budgets. And this is why I think some of the FAA projects kind of go up and go down. And, you know, I mean, good example would be the rollout of ADSB and particularly the rollout of satellite ADSB because they don't have visibility over the horizon on funding, which we do. Um, now, we didn't think this was going to happen as 
But like, you know, let's assume we get back to normal by middle of next year, we still have a reasonable amount of visibility. You know, it's interesting you touched on business aviation, which has a different way of funding the air traffic control system. The business aviation operators, uh, particularly the Part 91, pay for uh, for these services through a federal excise tax on fuel, which going back to one of the first conversations we had actually has an incentive for, re for more efficient aircraft because a reduction in fuel consumption actually results in a reduction in the federal excise tax. Yeah, no, 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 that, that, that is true. But, but what I, I think that the totality of the system needs to, be, needs to be addressed from an FAA point of view. I mean, if you're looking at sustainability, again, um, you know, what's really important, Daniel, if you, is what fuel you're using. So keep, let, let's get to the point in Europe. Like, we're talking about SAF, sustainable aviation fuel. Yep. We don't have any production capability at the moment. Nobody's producing it, virtually none. And where you can get it, it's three times the price of J1. So nobody's going to use it. So we've got to produce incentives for this on both sides of the Atlantic. And this is where I think that we've got to try and align what, what we actually do. So for the environment, for me, you know, SAF is a very important thing, and but also the new technologies around hydrogen. And here's an interesting thing. We've seen the return of supersonic, you know, transport coming back. You know, there's a number of operators even looking at green supersonic. Now, I can't get my head around how that works, considering the propulsion you need, but it is a discussion. So there's a lot of new exciting initiatives that I think are going to be needed to, to protect the environment. And I think guys like you who offer services to airlines you know, because airlines are going to be under pressure to have fly a better route, to use more sustainable fuel, to have a lower CO2 footprint, and to also, from a commercial point of view, to lower their um, their carbon offsetting trades as well. So there's a lot of product there, I think, that is very useful. And people need to be aware that airlines can save themselves a lot of money if they do this thing correctly. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think that there's a lot of technology that's coming into play, right? You touched on flight planning route optimization, touched on, um, you know, reduction in, in emission, right? So more efficient aircraft are, are, are certainly a factor in that. We've talked a lot about air traffic control delays. As it relates to SAF, we have more production in the US. Certainly, uh, distribution is a big issue. I think a factor that we're seeing is the continental United States is huge, right? And we uh, not only have distribution issues getting SAF from one place to another, but a tremendous number of airports, not only in the commercial sector, but particularly in business aviation. And so a conversation that I'm seeing take place between FBOs and large business aviation operators is they're saying, well, you're only offering SAF at a very small number of airports. Let's, maybe it's fewer than a dozen in many cases, and they're flying to the 2000 something airports around the United States. And so um, a an opportunity that's come to fruition that has some technology elements as well is a program that allows operators to essentially purchase SAF, even if they're at an airport that doesn't have it, uh, reduce, not have any of the distribution overhead that just doesn't have the economies of scale right now. And then an operator that isn't purchasing SAF at an airport that does have it can actually receive that in their aircraft. And so that's a stopgap that allows operators that have that uh, environmental focus that are willing to pay the premium, they can purchase it essentially any anywhere they go. For example, at a signature flight support, they're a big proponent yeah. of that. Uh, and then they don't really have to have any of the inefficiencies. You, know, you don't want a, uh, a truck to drive across the United States with a thousand, a thousand gallons of SAF while burning diesel along the way. So it has to be done efficiently. And I think that's an interesting approach, uh, perhaps something that something we'll see across the Atlantic as well as it rolls out there. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree with you. Um, it, it, it's a big problem, Daniel. I mean, the rollout of SAF is, is, is a major issue. In Europe, where, you know, British Airways, for instance, are, are partnering with, with two firms in London to do that. KLM have a very, very good project. So I think we'll see a little bit of take up. But realistically, you know, if you look at, for instance, say common engines like, say, the CFM 56 or those types of engines, yeah. you look at a mix ratio there. You know, to get to a 30% mix ratio is going to take it's going to take a lot. It's going to take and you know the question about engine certification and propulsion and maintenance contracts. So some of the actual you know maintenance contracts of engine, engines at the moment, you know, I find preclude you from using SAF. You know, so we've got to straighten out the whole what I would call regulatory chain as well as the supply chain. And to me, you know, the more the quicker you get a marketplace going in SAF, and here I would think like SAF futures and secondary trading in, in SAF, the more you start making a financially good product, the more people will start producing it and we'll drop the price. Because uh, honestly, Daniel, I don't see SAF taking off when it's three times the rate 
uh, the price. You know, I know that it's never going to be the same price as J1, but, you know, the current factor at 3 to 3.5, you know, the, yeah, the operator, right. like say Reiner, is better off just pay the, pay the carbon credit. You that's know, right. it saves you a lot of messing and, and it's a lot of that, you know, so difficult situation. It's it's early days. There's no question about it. And, and only the most environmentally minded operators probably are willing to pay that premium. The good news that we're seeing in business aviation is that the engine manufacturers have come out uh, and this has been a huge initiative, for example, at Gamma, the General Aviation Manufacturers Association um, and MBAA to yeah. ensure that SAF is certified and approved for use in those engines. And so we've actually seen uh, virtually across all of business aviation approval for whether it be engine service contracts or power by the hour um, or, or, or warranty to support SAF. So it's, it's an interesting time. And I think that there's going to be a lot more change to come, right? Whether it be across uh, SAF, how flight planning is done, how CDM is done. And um, so we're seeing widespread change in the industry. And for us, the, the last year, just like at Eurocontrol has been has been about adapting. And so we've report prioritized projects. We've been supporting customers, whether it be financially uh, or technically in ways that we didn't anticipate, but we're looking for the long game, just like you, right? We're not, we're not focused on right now as much as we're focused on, let's take this time to think bigger picture. How can we have a bigger impact next year? And it's worked, you know, we've, we've continued to thrive during, during this last year and, and with no layoffs. Uh, and we've actually launched a new program at Flight Aware called Flight Aware Worldwide Teamwork, which is a ba basically embracing this remote work program. We have been remote since March of 2020. It's been a huge success. People are happy, um, better work-life balance, flexibility, you know, spending more time with family, not commuting. So this is our work from anywhere, work from home, hire from anywhere policy. We're seeing great recruiting around the world. And we're going to uh, double the company over the next two years. We're planning to hire about 50 people this year, and, and not just in the places where we uh, previously have hired in our offices, Houston, Austin, New York, uh, London, and Singapore. It's all over the world. So I feel like when we get out of this pandemic together, we're going to be stronger than when we're en entered and having an even bigger impact on the industry. And I've enjoyed speaking with you because it's clear that you're thinking the same way and Eurocontrol is thinking the same way. And you're going to exit this on the same mindset stronger than ever before. Hopefully so, uh, Daniel. I mean, you know, it's, it's a big challenge. I mean, you know, the European network is 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 going to take a bit of time to recover. I mean, the the area that I'm worried most about at the moment is the long haul. You know, we're not going to see long haul travel return on the North Atlantic, but equally so to Middle East and Asia till probably October, November. Um, you know, and it's a lot of bigger airports in Europe. The hub and spoke airports depend on this long haul, so a lot of operations are feeder operations. But in parallel to this, then. Daniel, there's a lot of areas in Europe that where connectivity is very important. And here you clash with the environment people, you know. So you look at the Western Isles in Scotland or the West of Ireland or the Greek Islands or Italy, there's a, there's a lot for small commuter aircraft. And there's a lot of small airports there that I worry about whether they'll be able to recover economically, you know, after this hit. Because they don't get the level of state support, you know, and they operate with low cost operators, particularly, you know, we have... Um, airports in Armenia and Georgia and places yeah. like this at the edge of the network. So there's a huge challenge. So for me, the important thing about using the current time is to kind of like, you know, we use the phrase build back better, but that's true to an extent. I mean, we don't have the flexibility that you have in terms of letting everybody off to, to um, work at home. We've like nearly a third of our staff working at home, but unfortunately, yeah. you know, we're mainstream operators and, and uh, we've managed to work like that. And, and, and I think that, work-life balance will change. I mean, just to give you an interesting fact, you know, uh, we, 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 we do a lot of work with, with um, the big uh, operators and, and the big operators and the CEOs of the airlines tell me that they estimate that one in four journeys, business class will probably be substituted, you know, so it'll be a Zoom call or like we're having now. So that's a kind of a 20% reduction. So that's going to change the way the aircraft is going to be configured, you know, probably less business class, a little bit more leisure, but I'm quite confident that air, airlines will return very strongly. And I actually don't subscribe to the general view that people won't travel as much. I think they'll travel more. I think there'll be pent up demand. And um, I believe in people flying. I believe in freedom. And I don't like being locked down and all these kind of things. So there you go. I mean, I agree completely. About, it's about travel. I think that um, 
Zoom is great. And I think that uh, it's here to stay and it will replace phone calls and it's more personal. Over the last year, I've had the opportunity to do a few um, small number compared to my normal weekly trips, but a few, a few trips and had some, some uh, you know, safe outdoor meetings with folks. And when I'm flying home, I'm thinking, this is incredible. I, you know, the, the amount accomplished in that 90 minutes, you know, having a coffee outside was 10 times, uh, you know, a, a, an entire day of Zooms. And I think this is better than a phone call. Uh, I think that I would have preferred to do this with you in person. And I think the impact would have been so much greater. I think that, um, I think you're right. People not only want to travel for leisure, but for business. I think there'll be a shift in business travel, but at Flight Aware, you know, I, I mentioned our worldwide program for, uh, for hiring, but we anticipate ultimately having, uh, you know, reduction in our large office expense, but massively increased travel expense, right? We're going to be bringing the, the entire team together globally multiple times per year. Uh, we're talking about teams getting together for team building. When we go visit a customer, we're going to bring more people because it's an opportunity uh, for, you know, bonding and for teamwork before and after the, the event. And so as, as a, you know, small uh, uh, you know, representation of what that's going to look like, we're seeing more travel and, and increased travel expense. And I think you're right, it's going to be different, there will be reconfigurations. Uh, but I, you don't talk to anybody that's saying, well, I haven't really traveled in the last year, and I'm glad, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or I'm not looking forward to it. Everyone is chomping at the bit. And I think we're seeing that a bit in the recovery in the US. And I think we're going to see that more broadly. And um, I'm optimistic that the, the next time I see you will be over a meal, uh, rather than over zoom. And so there's a transatlantic trip either in Houston or in maybe Brussels. A pint of, maybe a pint of Guinness now might be more my style, Daniel. How about that? There you go. I'm game. I'm just looking for the invitation and the opportunity to do yeah, it. And you're, uh, you're always welcome. You're always welcome. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. I'm looking forward to that, that invitation and you can know that I'll take you up on it and we'll speak again then. Okay. Thanks, Daniel. And listen, I wish FlightAware and all our colleagues in the United States the very best to, and your worldwide customers. Hope it goes well for you and uh, keep in touch. Likewise, same to you, your family, and our colleagues at your control. Okay. Thanks again, Eamon. Have a good evening. Also to you. Ciao. Yeah. Send it in half a minute.